From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. The first presidential campaign debate is only a week away, and a new poll shows Joe Biden has passed Donald Trump and now has a narrow lead. This follows the Biden campaign's decision to focus on the New York conviction of Donald Trump for hiding a hush money payment to an alleged paramour. Is that Biden strategy paying off? And what should we expect in next week's debate on that and other questions? Welcome. I'm Paul Gigo, editorial page editor of The Wall Street Journal, and I'm here with my colleagues Kim Strassel and Bill McGurn. Folks, I know it's only one poll, but this is something of a shocker from Fox News. They take polling regularly, and they're pretty respectable, very respectable, in fact, as a polling operation. And this survey shows Biden pulling ahead of Trump for the first time in months. And head-to-head numbers, let's take a look at them. Biden is up 50 to uh, 48 over Trump. It was 48-49 for Trump in May, only a month ago. That's in a two-way matchup in a multiple matchup with Robert Kennedy Jr., Cornel West, and Jill Stein. Biden is now up one, 43-42, whereas Trump a month ago was up 43-40. More interesting, I guess, is some of the numbers behind those top line numbers. And Biden's overall approval rating has moved up now to 45 percent, up from 41 percent in March. And Biden's approval rating has improved on the economy, which has been his biggest liability. 32 percent of voters say the economy is now good, up from 30 percent in May and 26 percent in March. 44 percent of the public say they are optimistic about the U.S. economy, which is up nine points from a year ago, and 41% approve of Biden's handling of the economy, which sounds bad, except that it was 38% in in March. And on head-to-head on the economy, Trump has only now a narrow five-point issue advantage over Biden. He has a nine-point advantage on inflation. But those are both narrower than nearly every other poll. So, Kim, how do you read all this? Well, I am certainly open to the notion that some of this is sinking in and that there might be a change. I think those economic numbers are very notable. There did seem to be in the poll a quite big shift among independents who were now more open to electing Biden for president. And you have to wonder if that might also have to do with the headlines sinking in about Donald Trump and his conviction in New York. But I'm going to hold off a little bit only because it's one poll. And I'll just tell listeners a little bit about some of the other things I think are worth looking at, which suggest maybe not as much movement. Um, one, if you look out at the swing state polls, Donald Trump has continued to keep a pretty significant advantage outside of the margin and error in a number of those swing states. That includes Arizona, Nevada, North Carolina, Georgia. He is all up by an average of five points on the Rural Clear Politics average. Pennsylvania is closer. It's more like two points. Wisconsin and Michigan are tied. But the other number that I've been looking at too, Paul, is presidential disapproval, at least in terms of a polling average. And if you look at that, Biden, I know the numbers were better in this Fox poll, but the rest of the polls that have been coming in, his disapproval remains 16 points underwater. There's a 56 percent disapproval rate at the moment. And that's about as high as it has been throughout his entire presidency. There was a little bit of a bump up there a couple of years ago. Then it got a little better. It's back up to some of its prior heights again. A recent Daily Cause poll had him underwater by 20 points. So I think we have to look at this with a little bit of caution, although what I do think it is is a big reminder to Republicans that they do not have this in the bag. This is a very, very tight race. And the President Trump, if he is going about thinking that this is going to be a cakewalk, he needs to remember the power of incumbency um, and his own liabilities. Yeah, just would underscore that point that the optimism that some Republicans, many Republicans have been expressing that this is all locked up, baby. The voters have already made their decision to fire Joe Biden. I don't think that's true, particularly, I mean, because of who he's running against. I think if Nikki Haley were running with a presidential approval rating like the one you described, Kim, I think she would be up considerably. I think that's right. And pretty much just about any other candidate, frankly, would be up. But Donald Trump is somebody the voters know and uh, 
their disapproval rating with him on a personal basis is almost similar to what they think about Biden. Bill, another thing that struck me in the Fox poll was the issue differences. I mentioned the economic issue differences. This is the head-to-head. Who do you trust to do a better job on the following subjects? Immigration, Trump's only up by nine in this survey. That's unbelievable given the fiasco of uh, Biden's immigration policy. Israel-Hamas war, Trump's only up four. The uh, stand-up to elites, Biden is up two. And, you know, you'd think he would be up more. Now, uh, I mean, that uh, Trump would be at more on this issue set. And these have been advantages for Trump all along, but that seems to have closed, at least in this survey. Yeah, I agree with Kim. From what I understand, most of the movement was among independents. Republicans and Democrats didn't really shift that much, but independents... Yeah, that's a big deal, Bill. Yeah, right? it is, because they decide the election, especially right. in the battleground states. I think between now and November, five months, A lot of things, because I think the margins are so narrow, could shift the election. For example, a bad debate performance by either of the candidates could really have an effect. It's kind of an extraordinary year, not just because of the two candidates, but the interest this early that we're discussing this is quite astounding that we're going to have a debate next week. You know, the typical line is no one pays attention till after Labor Day. I think this is going to have intense interest all the way through to November. And there might be some really jarring events. Now, I know a lot of Republicans think Joe Biden's going to get up to the debate and really make a fool of himself and have one of those moments we've seen on clips. But I would note that he hasn't done that so far. In his State of the Union, in Normandy speech, press conferences, so forth, he's mumbled a few times, but he's basically muddled through. So I'm not sure that that's going to hurt him. But certainly, if he has another moment, and now his challenge is that there's so many clips of him in recent weeks at Normandy, at Juneteenth, and so forth, anything he does is going to be viewed within that context. As for Trump, I want to get into this debate thing later. Let's take a break now and we'll talk about the debate afterwards. Welcome back. I'm Paul Gigo here with Bill McGurn and Kim Strassel talking about some new polling that has Joe Biden now ahead of Donald Trump, albeit within the margin of error. And one question to ask is, Did the conviction of Donald Trump matter to those results? Now, the Biden campaign thinks it does, clearly, because you can tell the campaign has dropped 50 million bucks, which is a huge ad buy to run an ad calling Trump a criminal. Let's listen to that clip. In the courtroom, we see Donald Trump for who he is. He's been convicted of 34 felonies, found liable for sexual assault, and he committed financial fraud. Meanwhile, Joe Biden's been working, lowering health care costs and making big corporations pay their fair share. This election is between a convicted criminal who's only out for himself and a president who's fighting for your family. I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this message. Well, so much for subtle messages. <laughs> Bill, what do you think of that message? Well, you know, Joe Biden's been criticized for this by Democrats, usually unnamed, but they say he should emphasize the issues. I'm not so sure. I'm not sure his ad is effective. It might be responsible for a couple points that we've seen, for example, in the Fox poll. But I kind of don't blame him because I don't think he has much else. He spent his entire first term not being Donald Trump, giving speeches on the threat to democracy implicitly Donald Trump. As a former speechwriter, I can't help but notice he never addresses a nation saying, we need this legislation. We need to do this. Here's the issue. It's always um, saving democracy from the threat of the orange man. So I'm not sure he has a choice. I think that might be his strongest choice. And it might be good for one, two points. Do I think it's going to trump going to the supermarket and paying 50% more for your dozen eggs or then going to the gas station, filling up and it's over 350 a gallon? I'm not so sure. Well, Kim, uh, to that point, it seems to me that both campaigns are polling constantly, right? So they must see some resonance with this uh, message, emphasizing the convictions with uh, swing voters. 
Remember, there aren't a lot of those swing voters in this campaign. As you know, most Republicans are fixed, Democrats too. But those who aren't could be affected by this. And the Biden administration must sense that there's some opening. Yeah, I was really struck. There was an opinion piece about a week ago by Joe Lockhart, who was press secretary to Bill Clinton. And the message of his piece was, as much as I admire my old boss, I disagree with him that successful campaigns are always ones that are looking to the future. In this case, we need to just be hammering home day after day. Trump is a convicted official, and we need to be looking to everything he did in the past to remind people that this is what they're going to get again if they elect him again, that this needs to be made into an either or election. And I think it's kind of an interesting acknowledgement if you really think think about that statement for a bit, because he was saying, don't get into the details. You don't need to talk about Stormy Daniels. Just repeat again and again that he's a convicted criminal. And I think the idea behind that is there's a recognition among some Democrats that the onslaught for the past six years, Trump-Russia collusion and the impeachments and the January 6th committee and the cases that have come out, there's so much that many Voters have just decided that it's all just buzz and they're not going to focus on it anymore. A lot of them are convinced that this is one and the same and that it's all trumped up, to use a phrase. But even independents, I think, have tuned some of it out. And I think this is an attempt by Democrats to reassert the gravity of the situation, as it were, by repeating that phrase again and again, suggesting that that simple fact that 12 jurors have now confirmed everything you ever thought you wondered and worried about Donald Trump. He is indeed guilty. Therefore, you shouldn't take a chance on him in office. And they're doubling down on that. The Biden campaign has more money than the Trump campaign at the moment. They've done very well in fundraising. So I think for them, they're like, hey, let's give this a go. And maybe they do have some polling already. Maybe that Fox News poll is the kind of follower, public follower of what they've been seeing internally to suggest this could have resonance. Right. Most voters will not have been paying attention to the case other than they knew it was going on and then they saw the the result. They don't know that some of us have been calling this a junk case all along because hush money payments aren't illegal and even hiding them on the books is only a misdemeanor in New York. And that DA Alvin Bragg kind of concocted the felony case, claiming that it was in the service of hiding some other crime, which he did not specify and did not require the jury to actually decide on guilt or innocence. So Trump, in my view, has a very good chance of winning on appeal. But if you're talking about the Hot house of a presidential campaign. Biden is just saying convicted criminal, convicted criminal, et cetera, et cetera. And just driving that point, it puts Trump in a difficult position because if he starts to talk about the merits of the case or to attack the prosecutor or whatnot, then it looks like he's playing defense and he's not going where I think, Bill, he needs to go, which he needs to focus on Biden's record. Yes. And I think he sort of knows it. Whether he can help himself is another question, but I think he knows that. And I think his stronger case is comparing his term in office with Biden's term in office and promising what he's going to do in the future to address the problems Americans are worried about, the border, the economy, crime, and increasingly the uh, clouds overseas with Russia, Iran, and China and North Korea. So I think that's where he has to hit Joe Biden. As you say, Donald Trump has a lot of vulnerabilities, but so does President Biden. And it'd be interesting to see how he reacts. You know, it seems to me the challenger always has some advantages. Trump had some in 2016. He's really a challenger, outsider. Hillary is an ultimate insider, wife of a president, running for a president. Then in 220, it switches. Biden's a challenger and Trump is the incumbent. Now Trump's back to being the challenger. So I think the more he hits Biden's record, which Biden has had difficult time selling, he's incoherent on immigration. And his problem with immigration is to to, to take any constructive measures that people want to restrict the flow of illegal immigration, he'd basically have to admit Trump was right because it came into office heralding how he is being the anti-Trump. And the same thing kind of on the economy. You know, he spent all this money. Then he tried to sell Bidenomics. It was a flop. And kind of the attitude was, well, you're not smart enough to appreciate just how good job I did. 
And I think, again, that's a vulnerability, and that's where Trump should really focus his attention. <laughs> 